Hey there, reflective listener. You're in for a solo episode. I'm going to be reflecting, uh, but just a couple things. This is uh, random reflections. I'm going to reflect a little bit about AI and some thoughts about AI and the creative world and, and what it means to us writers. I'm also going to reflect a little bit on the concept of writing to market, but writing to market with an additional hook that I think is so, so critical. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to a special episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. This is going to be a solo episode, and I'm going to be doing a few random reflections. And that's because this is going to be a slightly shorter episode, because this week you already had an episode earlier. So, you know, two earlier ones, you know, for the, the price of one, whatever that is. Anyways, that's coming up after this message from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you, the author, to get your audiobooks into the world's largest distribution to retailers and libraries. Yeah, that's exactly what you can get with Findaway Voices. You can use them to find a professional narrator. There's a DIY method via Marketplace. There is one that's controlled by project managers inside of Findaway Voices, so you can rely on their project manager to help you find the best narrator for your project, or you can use them to upload your own audiobooks. And one of the benefits of going with Findaway Voices is it's the only way to get your books into Chirp. Chirp is owned by BookBub, and as authors know, BookBub's a great way to promote your book. Now, I had a BookBub feature deal, a BookBub feature deal. I did not have a BookBub feature deal, but I had a Chirp feature deal in January of 2022 for my novel, A Canadian Werewolf in New York, and that's an audiobook. I worked directly with the narrator, Scott Overton. I paid him directly, and I uploaded it myself. Of course, you can find Scott Overton on uh, Find Away Voices Marketplace <laughs> if you're looking for a great narrator. But I had a chirp promo, January 2022, and it was phenomenal. I sold thousands of copies of A Canadian Werewolf in New York. And I also had readers on Chirp go on to buy other books in the rest of the series. So I have, I just learned today, and I'm recording this on December 15th, 2022. I just got back. I submitted maybe two or three weeks ago a Chirp deal for a digital box set, um, the audio box set called uh, Bundle of Frights and Fears. Fears and Frights, I'm trying to remember. I should I should know the name of this. But it is basically the, the two novels in the overarching larger story arc of Fear and Longing in Los Angeles and Fright Night's Big City. So I bundled those together, put them together. And it is going to be featured in late January of 2023. And it's being dropped down from whatever 20-odd dollars that it's selling for down to $1.99 US. And... I'm so thrilled. I am so excited about this feature. And getting a Chirp feature is only available through Find Away Voices. And if you want to see how you, as an author, can leverage Find Away Voices for your audiobook journey, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Okay, now some uh, recent comments, just some of the comments that uh, came out recently. Uh, first, uh, th these are both via Patreon, um, and even though they're very specific uh, to what was going on in Patreon, I um, I wanted to share them because I think it's valuable. So, Johanna Rothman uh, shared this in a comment via Patreon, 
And, oh, and, and I should give an update uh, about the planners, which I will do after the comments. But this was in response to me offering a chance for patrons to put their name in if they were interested in a planner. This is the 2023 Josie Planner. Let the ideas blossom. Uh, and that harkens back to a couple episodes ago where I interviewed uh, Joanne Carson and J.C. McKenzie. And Johanna said in her comment, uh, I don't want a planner, but I would like to know how they manufactured it and got it up on Amazon so that they didn't have to fulfill themselves. Now, this is the answer I left over at Patreon, but I'm also going to share it in audio here just for the benefit of other listeners who, who are interested. And thank you, Johanna, for asking that really great question. So they used a company called Vervante. So that's vervante.com. V-E-R-V-A-N-T-E.com. Now, this company is, or at least the local version of it, is based in Nanaimo, BC. And Joanne and JC live in British Columbia, Canada. So they, I'm suspecting they might have used a Canadian company because, you know, us Canucks have to pay through the nose when we get author copies of books printed in the U.S. and then shipped north. So that's how uh, they got it done. I know there are other platforms that do spiral binding as well, I, I, unlike the traditional POD uh, binding. But uh, hopefully um, that answers your question, so you guys can check out Vervante potentially for any of your projects. And, and again, Johanna, thanks for asking that question. And within a, a longer a message that I received via Patreon from Stanley B. Trice, he did confirm, I'd like to hear more from beginning or new writers too. And and Stanley, thank you for your your kind words. Uh, Stanley was getting caught up on uh, on episodes, <laughs> learned uh, that I picked up COVID at uh, twenty bucks fifty k Vegas, uh, or twenty bucks Vegas, I should say. And uh, and I was taking a long time for my voice to recover. I'm still almost quite there, but thanks for the concern, Stanley. And thanks for thanks for that comment as well. Um, there's several people who have said that they want to hear more from beginning or new writers too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my very best to have at least one interview every month with a beginning writer, somebody who's just about to publish a book or has just published a book, somebody who's at the beginning of their author journey. Because I think it's valuable to see the different ways that different authors approach this. Um, again, a beginning, uh, traditionally published author. I just want to talk to more beginning or new writers. I think there's value in that. And I appreciate hearing from listeners that you value that. So thank you, Stanley, uh, for the, the your words of concern, as well as, as that uh, important reminder that we should really... Uh, I should really uh, have more beginning and new writers too. It's not to say I'm not going to also have the writers who've been doing it for a long time or, or different experiences, but that's something that's really important uh, to you listeners. And I want to make sure I bring you more of that in 2023. If you want to leave comments, you can leave them over at starkreflections.ca for any of the episodes. You can also at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark. Leslie, that's while Twitter is still around before Elon Musk burns it to the ground. Um, and uh, I, uh, you can also, uh, of course, uh, yeah, leave them over at uh, things I post over at Patreon. But that's it for my comments. But I do appreciate the comments because it's a reminder that this, uh, this is a back and forth. This is a conversation. It is a dialogue and not unlike this solo episode, not just a Mark monologue. But that's it for those comments. Uh, let's play a bumper and uh, get to, uh, what am I going to get to? Um, probably, yeah, a brief personal update. Yeah, that works. Okay, uh, so personal update. I'm, I'm just going to give a bit of an update on uh, the winners of the um, uh, the Josie Planner uh, 2023. I had four winners and I've contacted all the winners. And from what I can tell, with the exception of, of the one winner in Canada, I had three winners in the U.S. and one winner in Canada, it looks like everyone should be getting their planners delivered to them. I believe I, I ended up, I, I checked Vervante.com and I checked Amazon, and because I have a Prime account and I get free shipping, although the free shipping doesn't apply to um, uh, this product because it's not sort of sold direct from Amazon. It's going through Vervante, etc. Still had to pay uh, shipping on that. But regardless, I think I, I went with Amazon because I already have my credit card information in there, and it was and it was an easier process 
um, to do that. But um, the three Americans um, should be receiving it by the 23rd of December. And I believe my one uh, Canadian uh, on the east coast of Canada who won uh, the planner may not get it until the last week of the month. But ideally it gets there before (laughs) December 30th. But again, I mean, even if it arrives in early January or halfway through January, come on, you still have the whole year there, right? Exactly. Um, But thank you guys. Again, just a thank you to all... All of the folks who uh, support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Require. Star- <coughs> ah, ooh, ah. We'll try that again. I might even leave this in. <laughs> For who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. Can you hear it in my voice that I'm, I'm kind of failing here? Uh, I'm going to have to uh, pause and take lot, lots of sips of water and, and potentially not go as long as I uh, thought I might go. Um, but I do appreciate you patrons uh, so much. I appreciate all my listeners. And so migrating into a more personal update, still writing, still writing Hex in the City. Uh, as of as of this morning and in the last couple of days, Julie and I bumped into uh, a, a bit of a challenge because I screwed up. I, I had something happen in my personal life with a dear friend and, and I spent a lot of time uh, with them uh, on the phone, um, wanting to be there for them. And everything's okay, or it will be okay, um, but that took precedent, and so that kind of pushed me off my schedule, which means uh, later today, Julie and I have to have a meeting because as I was going through and doing some uh, further edits and then adding to the manuscript, we're at about sixty thousand words in the first draft, so we're we're well on our way to the you know close to eighty thousand words before we have to get into the rewrite and then go through the editing in uh, January, but. Um, we ran into uh, sort of a, a change up, uh, a bit of a glitch, and it's mostly related to the fact that I'm not a good outliner. Uh, and so we're both, you know, writing with less of an outline. And sometimes you are the, the, the divergence that we take in terms of our understanding of certain things because they haven't been ironed down. Uh, it requires us to go back a little bit more, which is probably, I'm probably frustrating her uh, a lot. And, and I really want to make up for that. So hopefully we can iron out a few of those details in the meeting. So what that means is even though on the meeting schedule, I'm supposed to, she's writing tonight, she's going to write her chapter. I'm going to write, um, my next chapter on Friday. We're supposed to take the weekends off, but I'm probably going to be doing my writing a lot more of my writing on the weekend. But the other thing too, is, I mean, I have, I have a day job, uh, that occupies a lot of time. So that's been taking <laughs> a lot more of my time. And, and again, if I don't get the stuff written first thing in the morning, you know, between 6am and, and 8am, usually I don't get her done, uh, because I was planning on doing that. Um, and then I had that uh, thing happen with a friend. And so that kind of, uh, changed my plans. And of course, friends, family, uh, take precedent over the writing and I have to, I have to readapt. I have to readjust in, in order to keep on track. So that's, uh, going on personal. I also, with the success of the Canadian Mounted, I am working on two other similar books, uh, one for next year, one for the year after. I'll probably talk about that in a future episode, but I've already begun, uh, the research and the outlining, <laughs> I will rough outlining with nonfiction. I usually kind of outline what the, what the head chapters are going to be. And I've uh, been working on those and that's, and that's kind of intriguing. It's making me think about something. I'll probably bring it up in the random reflections later on, but in other personal, uh, updates in other, uh, personal news. No, you know what? I, uh, uh, that's it. <laughs> that's it for the personal update for this week. I've bored you enough. Let's, let's, uh, play the longer bumper and let's get into my random reflections. Okay, random reflections number one. Now, this comes from something I saw on Facebook last night, just before I was ready to go to bed. I actually, I copied it, I sent it, I messaged it to Liz. <laughs> I just said, oh, you don't have to read this, I'm just sending it. I wanted to send it somewhere. Uh, it was on my phone. I wanted to send it somewhere to remind myself to copy and paste it. And... We're seeing a lot about AI. We're going to see a lot more about AI. Everyone's playing with AI art and they're doing their AI art for themselves and they're discussing whether or not it's uh, ethical and blah, blah, blah. And, and people are getting as divisive about this as they have been about um, you know, politics in, in, in the last several years. And really 
kind of um, like getting really emotional uh, about this. And 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 so a friend of mine um, who's who's a writer and a creative and and a Linux genius, um, and he actually lives in my neighborhood. And he actually he's the guy who runs my my website or he hosts my uh, marklesley.ca website. Marcel Gagne, and, and and like me, he has a French name. And I didn't pronounce it Gagne, um, as, as you might have seen if you see the name. But see, I know how to pronounce the name with a little bit of a uh, Francais, uh, for a little French accent. Anyways, Marcel wrote this, and it's and I wanted to reflect on it because it's just so... It's such a thought-provoking thing. And Marcel writes a lot of really thought-provoking things that just make me pause and think. And so Marcel wrote... People argue that AI isn't actually creating anything. And that is basically just taking things other people have done and spitting stuff out based on whatever art, music, code, or literature it has consumed. Of course. But that's what humans do as well. All of us produce content based on what we've seen before, whether it's a painting, a music score, or a short story. In a very real way, we are all generative pre-trained transformers, GPT. (laughs) See what he's doing there? We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before. Now that's brilliant, and it's a really wonderful observation. And and, and there's a few things to reflect on. Let's start with the fact that, think about Shakespeare, the genius of William Shakespeare. And, and how a lot of his most popular tragedies that we still celebrate today and perform and read were consuming stuff from Greek theater and readapting them. I was just, and, and this is a reflection, I think this one went into the patrons, I was uh, reflecting on Malcolm Gladwell's conversations with Paul Simon. And Paul Simon talks about you know, hearing a snippet of music and being inspired by something. Uh, Gladwell talks about the fact that, you know, because Paul Simon was from Queens, Queens allowed him to kind of absorb from other cultures and, and musical stylings. And that's what, that's what helped him continue to experiment and explore in his own lifelong musical journey. When I think about Graceland and I think about the the, the, the dramatic and powerful influence of South African music and performers that he collaborated with on that album. It's a groundbreaking album, sold over 16 million copies worldwide because he saw something, he consumed something, he absorbed it, and he produced something. If you're a naturalist painting, Bob Vila, anyone? You're looking at something and you're painting it, trying to make it as realistic as possible. If you're an impressionist, you know, then obviously you would adapt a layer of change to that. It's not a photograph, but it's your own creation based on something you've seen. Whether or not it's exactly the same or whether you've adapted into like different stylings and watercoloring, etc. It's the same thing. I think about my writing and the things that I do. And this week I was on, I was on a podcast, um, a fantastic, uh, fantastic comic fan podcast. And I was talking about, uh, a Spider-Man comic from uh, 1974 or from earlier Spider-Man and the human torch team up and, and they fight the Sandman. And it was from Marvel team up number one. And it was this giant holiday grab bag. Uh, I'll have a link to that interview in in the show notes if you if you're curious to hear me nerd out about that. But my character Michael Andrews in the Canadian Werewolf series is an amalgamation of my love of growing up and reading the Bronze Age comic books. Characters like Spider Man, yeah, he he's he himself. Michael Andrews is a huge Spider Man fan. Loves Spider Man just kind of like me. But Michael's characteristics and, and the way he has enhanced senses are a combination of things that I learned and loved about the characters of Wolverine and Daredevil from Marvel Comics. Michael's turning into a wolf and having no conscious memory of 
the time that he is a wolf, when he's a Canis Lupus, is the Hulk, when you think about it. The, the original comic book Incredible Hulk, where there were these two conflicting personalities. And, and, and in some of the comics, there was the Hulk hated Banner, etc. But in, in, in some of the storylines, there was uh, Dr. Banner... And there was the Hulk and, and, and kind of like Dr. Banner would wake up and go, oh my God, what happened? And so Michael Andrews himself is an amalgamation of me having read and consumed and loved so many different comic books and then taking that all in and wanting to apply and adapt. Just like when we write anything, we pull in things from things we've read, things we've experienced, things we've heard. And those are just some of the things that I've adapted into my Canadian werewolf novels. So an AI doing that is just a different way of processing and it's a tool and, and yeah, we can be scared about that or we can figure out ways to leverage those tools. Just like you can say, well, for me to go from Waterloo to Hamilton, if I don't walk there myself on my own two feet, I'm, I'm not actually a proper traveler. Oh, well, well, okay, I'll take a horse. That's good. Okay, because horse is okay. It's acceptable. Oh, no, no, I'll take... Oh, my God, we got the... We got the uh, Ford has just invented this new, uh, you know, vehicular transportation with gas and everything and wheels. And is that really transport... Oh, no, no, no. What about a, what about a, uh, a Tesla, the electric vehicle that's going to get... Well, what about a train? What about a... Et cetera, et cetera. The technology has enabled us with tools... To get from point A to point B faster. Just like in any shortcuts and any technology that comes out, there's going to be those who are able to do things that couldn't have done it otherwise. We can bemoan that fact or we can celebrate the fact that it can make some things more accessible for other people. I choose to celebrate those things rather than fear them. I choose to embrace them because like I've said before, I don't want to be the disrupted. I want to be part of the disruption. And Marcel's quote is something that reminds me uh, of that. Next thing I was listening to earlier uh, today and yesterday, um, the latest episode of Sell More Book Show. And, and there was a really interesting... Uh, a news article bit that they talked about involving writing to market, passion, etc. And and they kind of came somewhat to this conclusion, but I even wrote on my whiteboard when I finished listening to that, I just wrote this title, uh, potentially for a book I'm going to write in my Stark Publishing series, is Writing to Market with Passion. Because one of the challenges and frustrations I've always had with writing to market is just writing to market just doing it for the sake of writing a market and chasing a trend is not the way to go. I I know if you do it at the right time, because the market's constantly changing, you can catch the right wave and things can work out well. But my argument is the importance of passion. Writing, and, and, and Brian and his guest host, I think it was Jen, hope I got her name right, my apologies if I didn't, talked about uh, the Venn diagram of, well, here's what's popular in the market and here's what's uh, what I'm good at or I'm passionate at and and trying to find the that crossover, right? That's 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 where the magic happens. And and I think about I think about I mean I think about Venn diagrams and think about how did I pitch the book Haunted Hamilton to the people at Dunder and I said, well, okay, this is a book for people who um, love ghost stories. Okay, that's one of the Venn diagram circles. Uh, people who, who, who really like Canadian history, local history, because you can't tell a good ghost story without history. And people who are really, really proud of the city of Hamilton. Like maybe they grew up there, they're connected to the city in some way. And right dead center in the middle is the target audience. And that's kind of how I pitched the book. And I always visualize those things when I pitch it. But at the time I was researching and writing Haunted Hamilton. I remember um, going for a walk in in the neighborhood where we lived with my wife at the time, and and we we walked by this old house, um, this old building that was the gatehouse of the of one of the mansions that I write about, haunted uh, place on on Hamilton Mountain. 
And and I saw the historic landmark and I went and read it. I went, oh my God, yeah, I was reading about this. This was the big, and I started explaining it. And I said, did you know that our entire, our this entire neighborhood was that rich guy's backyard way back when? And I started sharing this and this and this. And and I was new to Hamilton. She grew up there and, and, and I was new. And, and she turned to me and she said, wow, you're, you're really learning a lot about the city by doing this book. And, and by the time the book came out, I remember uh, one of the, one of the first talks I gave, I described this book, Haunted Hamilton, as my love letter to the city. As, as I was putting the book together, I'd lived in Hamilton for a number of years, um, over 10 years, but this was when I started to fall in love with the city. It was a passion project. Haunted Hamilton did really well, <laughs> sold that traditionally. The next book I did, uh, Spooky Sudbury, uh, where I grew up, did well. Creepy Capital, I lived in Ottawa, I was done well. Tomes of Terror, Haunted Bookstores and Libraries, are you kidding me? I'm a book nerd. Book places are the best places in the world. Did really, really well. Haunted Hospitals did well as well, because Haunted Hospitals was an interesting thing because we all have connections to hospitals in some way, shape, or form. We have, Most of us have been to hospitals if we weren't born there and uh, had uh, good things and bad things happen there. But also so many of the locations have been places um, from Hamilton and Ottawa and Sudbury uh, as well. And and, uh, and Rhonda and I ap- approached that book with passion. Now, Macabre Montreal, I loved working with Shana. Now, Shana lives in Montreal. And I really loved learning about Montreal. I really actually... I kind of really like the city of Montreal. Maybe I've only been there you know, a half dozen times. I've been to New York more than I've been to Montreal. Uh, I mean, Montreal's a gorgeous city. It has uh, so many different neighborhoods and flavors. It's such a... I've, I've, I've read about it as well. The apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz and all the different uh, places uh, where I've read about Montreal. Um, but I haven't... I didn't have the same personal connection to the city. And I'm not saying that that's related to the fact that it took, with all my other books, um, I earned out my advance, you know, on, you know, Spooky Sudbury in the first few weeks that it came out. But most of my books, I earned out the advance within the first month or two that it came out. Montre- Macabre Montreal, uh, it took us two years uh, to earn out the advance. And it's the largest marketplace. Montreal is the second largest city in Canada. And I'm not saying that uh, the book isn't good. And I'm not saying that Shane and I didn't work really hard at it and put a lot into it. And I'm not saying the experience uh, was anything but amazing because it was really awesome uh, to work on that book with Shana. What I'm saying is that I didn't have the same passion and personal connection. And that one didn't sell as well. That's only one factor, and it's, I'm not going to draw that conclusion, but it's the only one of my books that I didn't earn out the advance immediately. And it's the one where I wasn't as connected to it as I was connected to the other things. I'm really excited to write my Canadian werewolf books. Um, no, they've never been breakaway bestsellers. They've done moderately well. And when I run promos, they, they do moderately better. <laughs> I uh, chirp, book, chirp book deals, etc. But I'm having so much bloody fun. A Lover's Moon, uh, writing with Julie uh, and, and doing that romance was such a phenomenal experience because... I already love the character of Gail. I mean, Gail was the composite of, of the best of almost every woman I'd ever loved, fallen in love with. And Gail became a lot of the things I loved about Liz. Even in uh, the creation of the character of Gail, um, there were a lot of elements of you know the first date uh, that Liz and I went on. And in and, and and our early dating history. So I already loved Gail. And that was the reason I couldn't write her effectively. Because I couldn't give her faults. Because I loved her so much. Just like Michael. Having Julie take over Gail did something really incredible. Because Julie's really, really good at getting into a character's head. And loves characters with flaws. And she made Gail even more beautiful and amazing. And I love her more because of how Julie created her. And... The novel Hex in the City would not have existed without that dynamic relationship and the dialogue that Julie and I building the characters. We had fun. We were just playing. We were having a blast. 
making stuff up and goofing around. And so far, none of these books are, you know, New York Times, USA Today bestselling volumes of books, but I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying the writing of it. And that's compelling me forward, making enough money off them to keep things moving along. I think about my most recent project, uh, the Canadian Mounted, which um, was definitely a passion project. I'm a huge fan of planes, trains, and automobiles, and and I poured my passion in into that book. And and again, I loved the process. I really enjoyed it. It was so much fun digging in and and uncovering trivia and wanting to share that with uh, like minded fans. And and again, I've I've touched a teeny tiny percentage of all the fans out there, but. That's been a dramatic success. And that was where passion met, obviously met market in a, an important way. So I, again, for me, there's there's that importance of market. And I had a third thing I was going to reflect on. And it's um, some exploring that I, I did just earlier today with ChatGPT. But... It's going to take me longer to produce that because of the way I want to do it. So who knows if maybe there's going to be another short, slightly shorter episode coming up between now and next Friday. We'll see where that road takes me. I will, as I often say, I will burn that bridge while I'm standing on it uh, to mix metaphors. Um, but anyway, that's it for some of the reflections I just wanted to share. I do have uh, a few interviews uh, in, in, the, in the queue. Uh, to come up with, but um, it's so much easier for me to turn on the mic and ramble. I know it's lazy. I get it. I apologize for that. I hope you found some value in me doing that, just turning on the mic and and, and sort of reflecting on some things. I uh, I enjoy doing it. It's a lot less work in terms of the editing and re-listening back to an interview and, and trying to get everything in line there, but I just ran out of time, as as I sometimes do. So I hope you can please forgive me. Uh, That's it for the reflections. I do want to remind listeners that I have a code. I have a coupon code for uh, anyone who may be interested in attending the Superstars Writing Seminars in February of 2023, where I am going to be a guest speaker. I'm I'm on the slate to do two talks specifically. I may be on some panels and, and moderating a whole bunch of stuff that's going on there. I'll be doing, obviously, a talk on, on Draft to Digital, and I'll just be doing a, a general uh, talk about wide uh, publishing as well as, as I often do and participating in a whole bunch of other events. But if you're interested, you can get $100 off your registration for Superstars Writing Seminars for 2023. And the code is, and, the, and this will be in the, in the show notes at starkreflections.ca, the code is Stark, SSWS. 2023. So it's S T A R K S S W S 2023. And the S S W S is short for superstars writing seminars. So, um, again, uh, that's a coupon code. If you're interested, I'll have that in uh, the show notes as well. Other than that, uh, I want to thank you for listening uh, to the Stark Reflections podcast. If you enjoy this, please feel free to leave a review or share this podcast with someone that you think would find value uh, in it. That is a, a great way to to um, to help me out and, and to spread the word uh, about the podcast. So, without further babbling or rambling or even reflections, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. And until... We meet again until my voice meets your ears again. (laughs) Here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.